Last week when Edward taught the beginning of John chapter 18, we had moved from that upper room discourse, the farewell discourse, across the Kidron Valley into the Garden of Gethsemane where Christ was arrested. And he was taken to that unofficial mock trial, first to Annas, who was the former high priest, and then to Caiaphas, his son-in-law, who was the high priest at that time. I think he was high priest actually for about 20 years, Caiaphas was. And they still recognized Annas being the elder statesman. But uh, he then passed him on to Caiaphas. And that's the only one of the four Gospels that tells us that account. And then we have the story of the denials of Peter, Simon Peter. And it ended there in uh, verse 18, chapter 18, verse 27, where it said, Peter denied knowing Jesus, and at once a rooster crowed. And that's where we kind of stop. So what we're going to look at today is the trial before Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, which will cover from verse 28 of chapter 18 over to verse 16 of chapter 19. So it's kind of a, a longer narrative, but it all is telling the same story of this trial before Pilate. The only difference is in Luke's gospel, he does send him, Pilate does, to... Herod, who had, was up in Nazareth in Galilee, he was in town for the Passover. None of the other Gospels mentioned that, but we do have a little briefing when he sent to Herod. Herod just wanted to see some magic tricks. He didn't see it, so he sent him back to Pilate said, I find no guilt in him. So let's look then. We're going to read verses 28 to 32 of John 18 to begin. It says, Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters, So they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So after this mock trial before Caiaphas, Jesus had led this place called the Praetorium, which is the, the Roman governor's house. And you can see the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. So here they are. They have the, the God of all creation, the Son of God in human flesh, and they take him to be executed with a bunch of false charges, but yet they wouldn't step foot in the governor's house, for fear of being made unclean to celebrate the Passover. Think about that for a second. The hypocrisy, the the paradox, the evil that's in within them. Here they are. They don't want to be ceremonially unclean. What fools they were in their lust for power and status. Blinded by the evil one. If you remember what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, he said, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the glory of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And that's just a perfect description. They're blinded to the truth of who Christ is. Pilate then, at this point in time, was the Roman governor. He's actually appointed by the Caesar, Tiberius. So he was governor from 26 to 36 AD, which would cover this time period we're looking at. So what Pilate does, since they won't come into him, he acknowledges that he goes out to meet them. What's the charges? What are the charges? In order to have a trial, we have to have charges. You can't just bring a guy here for no reason. And listen to their answer. If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Well, that's not a charge, and that's not a, an answer. They just said, if he wasn't doing evil, we wouldn't have brought him here. Well, what are the charges? They could not answer the question. So Pilate says, okay, then take him and judge him yourself if there's no crime. Judge him yourself. The Jews answer, it's not lawful for us to execute anyone. Okay. The Romans had the authority over the executions of anyone under the territory of Pilate. So they were coming to him to get permission to execute Jesus. They obviously forgot about this a few months later when they stoned Stephen to death. (laughs) They didn't come to the Romans to get that approval. They just stoned him and got rid of him in their rage. So John again reminds us in verse 32 about prophecy being fulfilled. He says by what kind of death he was going to die. That's from John 12. Jesus told them 
And we go back even to uh, Matthew 20. Jesus told disciples exactly how he'd be ar- arrested and beaten and crucified. So this was kind of aligned with God's plan. In Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter 3, he quotes Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 21, where it says, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So Jesus then becomes a curse because of his blasphemy. we we'll look at here in just a little bit. He became a curse for us that he would suffer the wrath of God in our place. So that's what's going on behind the scenes. And we go down then to starting verse 33 over to the first half of verse 38. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world... My servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? We'll stop there with that question. What is truth? So Pilate goes back in to speak to Jesus. He's really shown the typical resistance of Roman officials to get involved in Jewish religious things. He did, they want to get involved in that. They kind of let the Romans have their own autonomy. They could do what they wanted to do as long as it wasn't any trouble. He's only interested in cases of political problems. Is there something here that would be a threat to the kingdom? And we have to deal with that. That's why he says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, did you come to that on your own or did others tell you about me? In other words, have you been doing your homework, Pilate, or are you just listening to what everybody else says? And listen to his reply, very sarcastically, am I a Jew? Again, displays a lack of interest in anything about the Jewish religious matters. So then he gets specific with Jesus. Basically, he says, what have you done that they brought you here to me to condemn you to death? What is it you've done? And he says, He proceeds then to tell him about the kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. He says this twice in verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. Remember, John uses repetition for emphasis. So this is something we want to kind of camp out on for a second. My kingdom is not of this world. In other words, he's saying, despite what the Jews may say or think, I didn't come here to set up a kingdom that would interfere with the Roman authority. I don't have land to defend and protect. I don't have an army that has to be funded by taxation. I'm not a threat to anyone. I'm not going to challenge the reign of Caesar. That's not my kingdom. The domain of Jesus Christ will be the human heart. The weapons Christ will use will be spiritual weapons. This kingdom will not be a threat to Roman authority. And we'll see later on in chapter 19, as we get into that, he even tells Pilate that any authority you have over me is coming from God above. It's given to him by God. And now we come to a discussion of truth. Notice there, he says, I've come to the world for this purpose, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who's of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate says, what is truth? Rhetorically, was he just saying that? What is truth? It's kind of ironic that here's the king of all creation, the one whose ultimate truth, in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right before him, and he's asking, what is truth? Jesus said, I came to bear witness to the truth. Like the sheep in John 10, remember he said, everyone who's of the truth listens to my voice. Who's of the truth? Those who have repented of sin and turned by faith to Christ. Those are the ones who believe in him. If we look at even John's first epistle, in 1 John 4, verse 6, John writes this. He says, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So Jesus is laying down the truth here, and John records that then later on in his letter. 
So Pilate asked rhetorically, what is truth? And so I, started, I was thinking about this, and I had um, taught uh, a course on worldviews for a couple of years, and one of the worldviews was postmodernism. And so I was thinking, is, is Pilate the first postmodernist before there was postmodernism, which says there is no absolute truth? That's the postmodern view. Your truth is your truth. My truth is mine. It's all relative to the situation that we're in. That is how we establish truth. There's no absolutes. And I was thinking about this, and I thought, well, if you know, you think about history, the first little sidebar here would we'll take just for a few minutes. Up to about the first 1,400 years of church history, God's word was the truth. That's what people believed in. That's how they lived their lives. And we get into this period called the Renaissance, about 15th, 16th, early 17th century in there. And Renaissance means rebirth, the, the reformation. And so we had these great thinkers that came along, great inventors, great philosophers. Think of Galileo and Da Vinci and Copernicus. We had uh, Johann Kepler and the printing press. And all these things were being developed. And so man was beginning to think and do things. But what is the nature of, of reality? You know, metaphysics, what is real? What is truth? And a couple people came to mind. One was Francis Bacon, who was an Englishman. And Francis Bacon is famous for what we call inductive reasoning, the scientific method, where we trust our senses, our eyes, our ears, our noses, and we can observe nature, and we can come up with what is real, what is truth. And so inductive reasoning, uh, we call the empirical method. If you have any science in your background, you know, the empirical method is all about studying nature and repeating things that we can know that they're true. At the same time, contrasting him was a French philosopher named René Descartes. And Descartes was all about, I can't trust my senses, I trust in reason. He's famous for saying, I think, therefore I am. You may have heard that saying before. And basically what it was, we start with a premise we know to be true, and then I reason through it. And Basically, the way he came up with that saying was, he couldn't tell if his own life was real. He could pinch himself, but he couldn't trust the pain that he could feel. He didn't trust that, but he said, I know when I think that I am a real person, I'm a real human. I think, therefore, I am. And so then, this is called rationalism, or deductive reasoning. I can take a truth and see how man has gone through all these hoops to try to find out what is truth, and here it is right here in God's Word. This is the truth. And so then, of course, after the Renaissance, we go into the Enlightenment era, and things got even worse from there during the Enlightenment. So let's look then at 38b, the second half of verse 38, just down to 40. It's a short little passage. But you see that the struggle for truth and Pilate you know, probably is, was influenced by you know, the Greek culture and even the Roman culture, the philosophers, and they had, you know, he had been influenced by that. And he's searching himself for what is truth, what is real. And so it says there in the second half of 38, after he'd said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release for you king of the Jews? And they cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. And then John writes, now Barabbas was a robber. Barabbas was a robber. So Pilate heads back outside. I find no guilt in him. Part of God's plan. And I want you to keep in mind, during this whole proceedings, God's in control of all this. Christ is in complete control. There's no, oh, I didn't see that coming at all in this. This is God's plan. He had to be the innocent lamb of God. And as you look at Pilate here, if you read this entire narrative from where we started until over to uh, chapter 19, verse 16, I call him Governor Yo-Yo. He's in and out, he's in and out. He keeps going back in, talking to Christ, going out, talking to Jews, going back in, talking to Christ. He's back and forth. He's really struggling with this. He doesn't know what to do with this man, Jesus. He's really struggling. So he goes out to meet the Jews. At the Passover, though, he comes up with this idea. You know what? He'd already sent him to Herod. Herod didn't want him. This is in Luke's version. So he comes back, and he's, he's like, well, I don't know what to do with him. Oh, I know what. There is this custom that I have uh, that will allow them to have a prisoner released. So I tell you what, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask him. I can release king of the Jews. No, we want Barabbas. And it said here, John simply states Barabbas was a robber. A footnote might say insurrectionist. Luke tells us he was an insurrectionist, 
which means he fomented revolution. He was an evil man. He was a murderer. He's a bad guy. They'd rather have him back on the streets than Jesus. Again, just more hypocrisy. But again, God's in control of this whole process. But you think humanly, search for truth, this whole thing, there's no charges against him. The whole thing's just all made up. It doesn't make any sense at all. The other thing to note, in Aramaic, the name Barabbas means son of the father. There's another little funny thing to throw in there, son of the father. The real son of the father was going to go to the cross. The fake son of the father, just by name, was going to be released. <laughs> so, let's go to John 19 then. This trial continues. Look at the first 11 verses. It's a longer passage. And Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Stop the reading there. Verse 1 tells us Pilate had Jesus flogged. Not much more is written about that. They didn't spend a lot of time talking about the physical punishment of Jesus. But I think we've probably seen enough images and maybe seen enough movies to know this is a very severe and brutal activity. Occasionally, the, if, the, if they use the leather strips. Now, the, sometimes in the other Gospels, there was a, a preliminary beating, flogging, and then there was the, the death flogging where they used bits of lead and metal uh, shards in it, and they would beat their bare back, and it would rip the flesh and muscle and exposing bone, and sometimes if it was deep enough, it could even puncture into the chest cavity, and he would die right there from the beating. Jesus survived the flogging. And it's one of those things where you think, well, the Roman soldiers heard, this guy claims to be a king. We're going to have fun doing this one. It was like extra brutal because this guy's a king. We don't want a king. We only have Caesar, and so they're going to take it out on him. They push a thorny crown into his scalp. I can only imagine on my head. That would really hurt. <laughs> There's no, no cushion at all, but I mean thorns, long thorns. You know, pound it down in there and then start pulverizing him. You know, put a purple robe on him. And beaten, they probably broke his nose and probably broke his, his uh, eye bones, the sockets, the orbits. And I started thinking about this too. And you think you know, they're mocking him, hail king of the Jews. And it comes back to Isaiah. If you remember the prophecy in Isaiah, there's this portion called the servant song. From 50 to 53, it's talking about this one who would come, who would be the savior. And in chapter 52 of Isaiah... Listen to what it says in verse 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, his form beyond that of children of mankind. Now, we didn't recognize him. And then drop down in chapter 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then if we go over to verse 7. We think about Jesus, his whole proceeding. He didn't once try to defend himself. He was just giving truth. My kingdom's not of this world. He didn't say, I didn't do anything wrong. He's not saying that at all. He's simply giving, speaking the truth. Verse 7 of Isaiah 53, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And we think then, 
this is a passage that was written 700 years before Christ. And as I, Isaiah gives us a pretty close enactment to what really happened, the prophecy of this Messiah. But keep in mind, Isaiah wrote 700 B.C., but it was a plan from all eternity to be this way. It wasn't new for God. It wasn't new for Christ. It wasn't new for the Holy Spirit. It was a plan from all eternity. Was it rejected by his own people? Unjustly condemned by a judge who found no guilt in him? And then delivered up to a most cruel and painful death? In the entire proceeding, we've heard of that Jesus on the cross was suffering the wrath of God. But I would petition you to say that even during this whole mock trial and this, the way he's being treated is part of the wrath of God. It didn't just start when they pound the nails into him. This whole process is the wrath of God being poured out on an innocent man, the innocent lamb of God. So Isaiah 53.10, right after that passage I just read, Isaiah writes, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Certainly. It's coming. Verse 4 is key. He says it again. Pilate went out again. I find no guilt in him. I had him flogged for you, you know, to kind of appease you. Now I'm going to let him go. He should be released. And they cry out, crucify him. Again in verse 6, crucify him yourselves. He says, I find no guilt in him. Three times, Pilate declares, this is an innocent man. There's no guilt in him. Of course there's no guilt in him. He had to be the sinless son of God to qualify to die for us on the cross. There's no guilt in him. We know that to be the grace. We come up with charges against Jesus in verse 7. Look at verse 7. He ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. They consider that blasphemy. This is from Leviticus 24, verse 16, which reads, Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. How, how ironic is that? He is the son of God. He's not blaspheming at all. In their eyes, he's a blasphemer, but he's giving, again, truth. This is who he is. This is his identity. He is the Son of God. But remember, they've been blinded to the truth. They're totally blind to what's going on. But this is all for God's glory. The plan of our redemption requires that Jesus die on the cross as the cursed of God. That's the only way our sin debt could have ever been paid. So this going just as planned even though it seems like, in our minds, it's, this is just such a travesty of justice. This is not right. But when Pilate finds out that there was a charge against him, he claimed to be the Son of God, now he's really worried. It says he's more frightened. He goes back inside to question Jesus again. Again, I call that yo-yo. He's going back and forth, back and forth. He won't answer Pilate's questions, though. Jesus won't do that until Pilate brings up authority. Jesus says, any authority Pilate has comes from the Father in heaven, which again affirms God's total sovereignty over all this. I mean, God puts people, people in positions of power, even weak and poor leaders, for his purposes. He's using the weakness of Pilate. The, the, this, this guy just wanted to keep peace. His job was to govern this area of the Middle East, this area called Palestine, and to keep peace. Whatever it took to keep peace. That's, that's all his job was. He didn't care about who Jesus was. He didn't care about their religion. He just wanted to keep peace. And so he's in position of power for this purpose because the, the weak knees soon come to fruition here that he's about to do. So let's look then at the last portion, verses 12 to the first part of 16. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you're not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was a day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So here's the scene. He's desperately torn, Pilate is, between his own best judgment, 
His own best judgment is this man is innocent. There's also his need to keep the peace with the Jews, to prevent bloodshed, to prevent an uproar, to prevent a, a riot. So he's still trying to figure out, how can I get rid of this Jesus? I've got, got to get rid of him somehow. If you remember Matthew, Matthew's account, Matthew 27, Pilate's wife came to him and said, have nothing to do with this man because I had a dream about him. And in this dream, I suffered much. And the Romans were big on dreams and interpreting dreams. And so this really frightened Pilate. He's remembering this, what his wife told him, and now he's dealing with a full throttle here. We also remember that, you know, he said, if you let this man go, you're not a friend of Caesar. Also in Matthew's account, then at the end, Pilate has him bring out a bowl of water. Very symbolically, he washes his hands and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. So it's going to happen, but I had nothing to do with it. Let history say that I did not have anything to do with the death of Jesus. But at this point, anyway, the, the, the Jews play their trump card, no pun intended. They play the trump card. If you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes the real king, Caesar. And Pilate responds, shall I crucify your king? Shall I should crucify your king? The chief priest, in all the betrayal of their religious heritage, in all the betrayal of the one true God, these are the Jewish leaders. Look what they say. We have no king but Caesar. It was that important to get rid of Jesus Christ. They denied that God was their king. They'd rather have Barabbas on the streets, a murderer, than Jesus back on the streets. Hearing this, then, Pilate reasons it's better for one innocent man to, to die, an innocent man to die, than to have a whole riot and have all kind of bloodshed. So he turns Jesus over to be crucified. That's how the story ends. This whole thing. Ordained by God from eternity past. This is how it would be. He had to be the innocent son of God. He had to be the perfect lamb. Obviously, there's no guilt in him. Obviously, these trials were, were, were nothing. I mean, here's the guy in charge three times. I find no guilt in him. Of course. He's totally innocent. So that's the story of the trial before Pilate. Does anybody have any questions or comments?